I think it's important to start with the why question. So besides selling JPEG monkeys, what are we all doing here? I think we've reached a critical mass, or we've gathered a critical mass of people here that actually believe we stand a chance at re-architecting, rethinking, and even adopting some core level um, systems that we, we rely on, things that touch on uh, our, our governance systems, our financial systems, and uh, some of our social coordination systems, so how we, how we work together. Um, I think our window of opportunity is unknown, so ultimately we, we should seize on that while we've got it. The success of Ethereum and decentralized technologies is, um, or perhaps should be measured uh, in terms of adoption, and by adoption I think that at least a couple of the things that uh, move the needle most are number one, that we're solving real problems, and number two, that we are providing powerful and accessible tools for people to solve real problems. And my thesis here is uh, that the latter comes first, in, in that uh, it is unlikely that one DAP will solve all the world's problems or one sphere of the world's problems, right? By putting powerful and accessible tools in people's hands enables them to solve their problems locally. And so that's where I think I can move the needle anyway. So this is the sort of the framing for this talk. My goal is to uh, increase awareness of a set of Python tools, some best practices, and some other projects that I think you might benefit from being aware of. Um, sort of the template for this talk is that I'll give you just enough information to know whether you want to learn more about it and uh, point to somewhere where you can learn some more. Uh, so this is a blog post I wrote about a year ago now that I think is still relevant that digs a bit further into this call to action. Uh, so this is meant to be beginner friendly, sort of a series of lightning talks smushed together. Sound good? My perspective is informed by five years at the Ethereum Foundation, um, thinking a lot about what it takes to get people to adopt this technology. Uh, starting on the Mist browser team, uh, where we produced one of the first UIs for Ethereum, uh, when we sunset that, the team moved over to do some UI experiments on configuring and running um, Ethereum clients, called that Ethereum Grid. And a couple of years ago, I pivoted to the Snake Charmers team, the Ethereum Python team, where I write some code, but also um, prioritize creating education content. In the last year and a half, my life has done some zigging and zagging. My wife and I welcomed triplets into our family, and then while I was on paternity leave, I helped uh, establish DeveloperDAO, which is a very reasonable thing to do. I'm excited about DeveloperDAO because it's, it's sort of this hive mind of, of bright and passionate people, all sort of focused and in digging into this, this solving challenges of adoption. I'm proud to be part of this Ethereum, uh, Ethereum Foundation Python team. Um, we are a small team, and we'll be, most of us will be hanging out at an impact booth hub uh, for a lot of the day tomorrow. So if you want to come say hey, uh, meet some of the team, and get some um, very exclusive snaky McSnake face swag, um, come find us there. Come hang out. Uh, we just welcomed our fifth teammate uh, this month, Linda. So hi, Linda. Welcome to the ruckus. I'm going to take a moment to burn a couple seconds of time here that I don't really have to say that this is like a full circle moment for me. Um, when I joined the EF in 2017, my first DevCon was uh, in Cancun, DevCon 3, and Ev Fraga is in the audience who was on stage giving a shout out or like giving the talk for the Miss Browser team, and he gave me a, a welcome shout out. So I am, it brings me joy to make this a a newfound tradition. Quickly, the EF Python team manages or maintains um, about a dozen Python libraries, um, most notably Web3Py and PyVM. The rest uh, sort of roll up into those two libraries or help make those two libraries work. Um, a shout out to our open source community of uh, contributors. They also help things uh, move along here. And um, shout out to our, uh, the snake charmers who've come before us that kicked off essentially all of these libraries. Let's get to Web3Py then. Starting with the why question again. Why does Web3Py need to exist? And the same question is applicable to Ethers.js, 
Web3.js and language, uh, you know, libraries in other languages? The short answer is because JSON RPC exists, or uh, more specifically that the execution clients in Ethereum speak JSON RPC um, to, if you want to communicate with them, you have to speak their JSON RPC standard effectively. So in a command line, if you want to make a, an ETH call request to an Ethereum node, might look like this, where you've got a stringified uh, JSON object that you're passing along. The Ethereum client comes back to you with this um, bit of this, this blob of data, which is then up to you to decode and make sense of. Web3Py and similar libraries give you like a human readable interface for this. So you make the request for whatever it is you're looking for, and uh, ideally you get back exactly the data you're looking for. Um, for the deep dive into what happens under the hood there, I've got another blog post for you. So what might you know Web3Py for already? Um, in order to communicate with an Ethereum client, you'll have to configure a provider. This is, um, this is your friendly reminder that uh, the most secure way to do this is to run your own node on your own machine and connect to it via an IPC socket. All know well that this is an unreasonable ask for most of the Ethereum community, so I'd like to plug here another project to keep an eye out on. The Portal Network is, uh, there was a great talk given yesterday by Piper Merriam uh, about the Portal Network, what it is, how it works, what the progress is. The idea here is that uh, there is a, a fundamental redesign of the peer-to-peer -peer protocols to actually allow uh, light clients that are light enough to run in your consumer-grade hardware, so your laptops, your Raspberry Pis even. That's in flight. There are three clients that are um, being implemented, and the spec is effectively done already, so hopefully coming soon. In the meantime, use your HTTP or WebSockets providers as needed, and once connected to your node, you can do various things like look up account balances, um, convert between Way and Ether, send Ether from one account to another, deploy contracts, um, interact with deployed contracts, get block data or transaction data, and then watch for events as they occur on chain. That was intentionally quick. If any of these concepts are new to you or um, you're new to Ethereum in general, then welcome to this weird and wonderful world. And uh, our docs are fairly good, but I've also written a couple of introductory blog posts that will hopefully make these concepts a bit easier. So what's new? Uh, a lot of work has gone into making async functionality just plain work in uh, Web3Py this year. We've started with the HTTP provider because that's where the biggest bang for the buck is. This is available today in beta versions of Web3Py. Instantiating uh, or like con configuring uh, these new providers is a little bit more verbose and that will improve over time, but you're welcome to use it already. Uh, so very quickly, like an example of what some Python or asynchronous Python code might look like. Um, in this example, we're just grabbing the first 50 blocks from the Ethereum blockchain using async IOs as completed method. So as each one of those requests goes to your remote node and comes back, we just print out the block number that was received. So you'll, you'll get it in, in this case, a fairly random order. Uh, the, the takeaway here is that if you spend a lot of your um, application doing read operations, um, you, in particular, to and from a remote node, uh, you can see some massive um, uh, performance improvements like in the neighborhood of 10x. Moving right along. ENS support is uh, not new to Web3Py, but it's gotten some love in the last year. So you might know it best for looking up the, like it's read operations. So looking up the an address, an address for a name, resolving a name from an address, or getting some arbitrary text that ENS allows you to uh, store as part of your record. Uh, new this year is async support for ENS. So if for whatever reason you want to fetch the address of Shaq, Vitalik, and Paris Hilton in 30 times in rapid succession, you can see some massive gains in performance here. Uh, same async IO as completed code sample there. That's the takeaway. Your gains are, might be even more significant than the uh, standard Web3 methods. Let's get a little weirder. Web3Py introduced support for um, CCIP read functionality. 
So uh, this EIP was introduced by Nick Johnson of ENS. Um, CCIP stands for Cross-Chain Improvement Proposal, and read alludes to you're reading some data on off-chain or um, otherwise not on Ethereum mainnet. So this EIP uh, introduced a standard for contracts to let the user know it's uh, going to fetch some data from somewhere else other than mainnet Ethereum. The simple version of how this works or what this introduces is just a pattern for using a custom solidity error to return uh, some metadata. In, of, of note, you can include one or more URLs where that off-chain data can be fetched from, and then a callback function for where that off-chain data should be returned to to be verified as authentic, essentially. This diagram uh, is included in the EIP, and we're going to use it as a, a quick example of what this looks like in practice. So the use case we'll chat through is uh, ENS um, placing some, or their, let's say ENS is uh, some subdomain is registered on a, on a layer two, like optimism. In our case, the client is, is your Web3 uh, script or app. Uh, we will be making some funk in this case is looking to resolve the uh, domain or the subdomain of an address. The contract is an ENS resolver contract that says uh, this value does not live on mainnet Ethereum, but you can find it on uh, off-chain somewhere at this optimism gateway, for example, and that information is packaged up in this off-chain lookup revert message. So under the hood, without the user having to know this is even happening, uh, Web3Pi will go and make a get or post request to that uh, optimism gateway, get that address back, and then pass the relevant data to the specified callback function. The callback function within the same ENS resolver contract then reads the signature, verifies that this address came from uh, a source that it trusts, and sends back along the answer to uh, Web3Pi. So from a user standpoint, this looks dead simple, right? You are just looking up the address for a name, and you get a value back. And this address might actually live uh, on Optimism, on another L2, on uh, somewhere else entirely. So just for context here, ENS had to implement a protocol change of their own to support this functionality um, called wildcard resolution. If you're interested here, they've, they've got a, a full open source example of their resolver contract that supports this functionality. Also of note, um, Nick is giving a talk directly after this one, and I believe he's digging in a bit further into CCIP read functionality. Cool little update from last week. Uh, the Lens Protocol folks announced that they're going to be using the same feature set to supply um, social graph data from, from uh, their protocol via their own ENS resolvers, I guess, they're running. If, for whatever reason, this uh, functionality introduces some security concern that is not compatible with your use case, you can uh, fundamentally disable that at the provider level. level or uh, at the contra or the, the call level. And then again, for more information, go hang out with Nick or check out this blog post. If you are looking to do something outside of the normal scope of what Web3Pi does, you have a few options. The first is middleware, and this is the most common um, uh, tool you will reach for. Effectively, what it does is it lets you inject some uh, behavior either just before a call goes out or just when it returns. Um, so you might be using this for some special uh, logging behavior, some data visualization, um, some additional like munging of, of data points or uh, whatever your use case might be. It's pretty flexible. And then you inject that into what we call our middleware onion. Uh, your next option is uh, a custom method. So if you're using a, a client like Aragon or uh, Otterscan, one of these that have some non-standard RPC, functions, you can choose just to uh, lump those directly into the, the ETH module or whatever feels appropriate for you. And you can use some of our data formatters and call that just like you would any other uh, ETH method. Also of note here is that you can use this to override any existing method in the, um, in the module. So if you want to change the way that any call or getting of gas works, et cetera, et cetera, you can essentially 
uh, replace it with your own version. Uh, your third option is external modules. This is intended to be plugin support. So if you want to include an entire API within Web3Pi, um, a whole set of functions, uh, you can do that via external modules. This is very flexible as well. You can, um, our only stipulation is that you create these as classes, and if you need to make use of the parent Web3 module, then you, are, or you have access to that via the, the init method. You can nest these how you choose. I think that's all there is to that one. Uh, and fourth, custom providers. You're unlikely to reach for this unless you're creating something like a custom test harness, or you just need to fundamentally alter the way that every request is made. I'll leave that one there. Finally, uh, I don't recommend it, but if you got to monkey patch things, do what you got to do. For more context on when you might reach for each of these, got another blog post just for you. We good? We taking breaths out there? All right, let's talk about the merge. As an app developer, um, what do you need to care about? The good news is uh, that not much else, like not, not that much has changed here. So um, a couple things. Uh, we said goodbye to some test nets. Gorley's still a good choice. Sapoli is uh, still good as far as I know as well, too. Block times changed. There's maybe a sub subset of applications this might be relevant for. Pre-merge, a, a new block was added to the chain every, on average, 13 seconds with high variability. Uh, in our new world, we have a new block every 12 seconds even with much less variability. And I think it might be useful to understand where that variability comes from by differentiating slots and blocks if you're not familiar. So every 12 seconds, uh, a new slot is made available. And uh, a randomly chosen validator can then propose a block to fill that slot. And if a validator is offline for whatever reason, then we might miss that slot. And you're waiting for the next 12 seconds for the next slot to fill. So that's where your variability comes from. Uh, this happens very infrequently, but it does happen. Next, we've got block identifiers, or sometimes called, sometimes called block tags. So you might be familiar with latest or pending or adding a specific block number if you want to uh, specify when a particular uh, ETH call is made. Uh, we've got a couple new ones now, safe and finalized. And the short version of this is that safe is uh, going to give you a result that is uh, based on a period where it is very unlikely for a block reorg to occur, and finalized is one in which it is extremely unlikely for a block reorg to occur. So based on your use case, uh, explore those block tags. And finally, we've got the Beacon API, which has existed for a little while within Web3Pi, but maybe it's more interesting to you now. Uh, we've got, there's nothing fancy here. It's a very uh, simple wrapper around um, the Beacon node, um, RESTful HTTP I, uh, endpoint, HTTP endpoint. I don't know where the I came from. That's about all there is to that. A couple debugging tips. Um, these both revolve around ETH call. Um, I've prepared this little example scenario, but in the interest of time, I'm going to skip straight to the good stuff. What is ETH call? You might be familiar with it. Um, uh, you're probably uh, more likely to use it uh, on, as attached to like the, the contract um, object. So for example, you, if you're going to execute a function on a contract, you effectively have two options to do so. One is um, to call call on that method or transact. Transact will submit that application to the transaction pool to, be, to get picked up. But if you call call, uh, that simulates the effect locally. So that didn't feel like the perfect explanation, but let's see if we can get there. ETH call simulates a tra transaction in your local environment. We're going to use it in isolation here to like highlight a couple of uh, debugging tips that might help you out. The second uh, parameter it takes, the first is the transaction. The second is that block identifier. And uh, the default is latest, so you would play out a transaction in uh, whatever the current state of uh, the blockchain is. Let's say, for example, you wanted to find out why a transaction failed um, so at some point in the history of, of the chain. So the revert reason is not something that's stored on chain, but you can get it by uh, essentially replaying a transaction at the time it originally occurred. So in this example, we've got a transaction we're interested in. We build up a transaction, a new transaction object to replay, and then we call it at 
that block number minus one to replicate the state that it was in at the time it occurred. Uh, and then you get that human readable revert message that you can then do whatever it is you need to do with. Uh, for some more detail here, another blog post, but that's not all. There is a third uh, optional argument on ETH call, at least uh, within Geth and Aragon and possibly some others, called state overrides. This can save you some serious development cycles if you um, need to get a contract in a specific state to uh, perform whatever testing it is you need. For example, you need uh, specific state values in that contract, or you need the you want to even alter the bytecode a little bit to, or like the the operations within some of the contract itself, or like undo a condition for which the contract would normally revert, just to see what would happen otherwise. You can override that in real time within the ETH call method. In this quick example, um, I am telling I'm using. Um, so in this example, we are we are telling ETH call that. The contract that lives at this particular address, I would like you to replace its runtime bytecode with this altered version that I've made, this version that I'm interested in testing. And then uh, we can run that. And in this example, we've got a, a successfully executing call in the last example that would have reverted. Uh, for more detail here, check out the blog. Finally, last chapter. We, the Python team, uh, know that as time goes on, more and more of our users are going to be using our tools through one or more layers of abstraction, and that's a good thing. Um, specifically in mind are development frameworks that um, sort of package together a bunch of functionality that let users be super productive in a, a much shorter time. So um, I'd like to encourage you, if you haven't yet, to check out uh, our friends over at Ape. They, are, they can be thought of as like the, a Python version of Hardhat. And um, they are, I think, more and more in the future, they will be our biggest, or they will be the biggest consumers of Web3Pi as a vehicle for their users. Um, so again, this, this gets us, this enables our users to be more powerful, to do more, and to solve their local problems. So that's a good thing. So that's, um, that's what I've got for you. We covered everything today. Uh, show of hands, make it a little interactive. Did we touch on anything you weren't already aware of? Is there anything that you're ready to dig into a little deeper? That's like, for the camera out there, that's like 4,000 people that all raise their hands. That's cool. Cool. Then mission accomplished. Um, again, the snakecharmers.ethereum.org blog is where a lot of this lives. If you'd like to um, catch up, review on uh, any of what we've chatted about today. And eso es todo. Muchas gracias. We have room for some questions from the audience. Uh, just a quick comment in terms of slots and block times. There can be mixed, uh, missed slots where the slot occurs, but there is no block. So the block time doesn't necessarily increase every 12 seconds. Uh, yeah, thanks for clarifying, though. I'm not certain I, I got the clarification. Um, so a block, I think we're on the same page. A block can fill a slot every 12 seconds. But it doesn't always. Correct. Everyone? <laughs> we'll have to...